Katha. Hi, Glenn. How are you doing? I'm doing all right now that we've solved all our technical problems for the moment. We did. We had a lot of behind the stage difficulties that we've spent a long time resolving. So hopefully this is going to work. I hope so. So welcome to your Bogging Heads debut. It's very exciting. Well, yeah. If this is indeed my Bogging Heads debut and this is actually recording. It's at least um, your debut attempt. Excuse me? It's at least your debut attempt. Okay, my debut attempt. Here we go. All right. Um, so why don't we introduce ourselves? It's the traditional way to start these. Okay. I'm Katha Pollitt. Um, I write a column for The Nation magazine every other week called Subject to Debate. I'm also an essayist and a poet. And I'm Glenn Greenwald, and I write at Salon. So the reason that we are gathered here, um, you and I, uh, is because there's been this sort of raging debate that's been taking place, um, largely though not exclusively among progressives, regarding uh, the candidacy of Ron Paul. And I've written a couple of pieces on that topic. Um, you wrote a column on that topic that in part replied to some of what I've said. Um, and we seem to have different views on that and um, are sort of representatives of, of two camps that um, have arisen and thought that a discussion might be constructive. Hopefully it will be. Um, so what I would propose we would do, if it's good with you, is have each of us just take a couple of minutes to sort of summarize the positions that we've expressed in this debate, um, just so that we're at least on the same page with what each other thinks. Does that make sense to you? That sounds good. Would you like to go first? Sure. Um, so, you know, the reason why I think that's a, a good thing to do is because I, I feel as though um, a lot of people in these debates have been, in this debate, have, have been speaking past each other, um, and in some cases even distorting what other people are saying. I certainly feel like the arguments I've made have been pretty radically distorted in, in certain instances, um, including in, in your column, to be honest. Um, I don't think it was deliberate or, or, or malignant or anything like that, but I do think you misstated what I said. So I, I just want to summarize what I have said on this topic and what I haven't. Um, I began writing about this topic about 10 days ago, and the very first thing that I did before even getting to the topic itself was to explain what it was that I wasn't saying. Um, and to also explain why I thought that the argument that I was making was going to be distorted and how it would be distorted. And what I said was that it's very difficult, especially in an election year, but even generally, um, with partisan tribalism and loyalties being as intense as they are, to talk about two different candidacies for president, one in one party and one in the other, without having it be misinterpreted that you're endorsing one or, or, or opposing the other. Um, and I made very clear that I was not in any way endorsing Ron Paul's candidacy, um, that I was not arguing that he is better from a progressive perspective overall uh, than President Obama was, um, and that I was not arguing that progressives in any way should support Ron Paul instead of President Obama. Um, and in fact, not only did I not argue that, I actually repudiated that position. Um, and I made a, a pretty extensive argument um, about why it was that progressives would be perfectly reasonable um, and, in, 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 and entitled to vote for President Obama over Ron Paul or to support his candidacy. Um, so I began by saying I'm not endorsing or expressing support for Ron Paul's candidacy, and I wrote sentences like, it's perfectly rational and reasonable for progressives to decide that the evils of their candidate, President Obama, are outweighed by the evils of the GOP candidate, whether Ron Paul or anyone else. And I wrote things like, there are all sorts of legitimate reasons for progressives to oppose Ron Paul's candidacy on the whole. So when I read in The Nation, I, I, like I said, I expected lots of people were going to distort that and, and claim I was endorsing Ron Paul. I didn't expect that you were going to do that, um, to be honest. I was pretty disappointed when I, in your column, read, Salon's Glenn Greenwald is so outraged that progressives haven't abandoned the warmongering, drone-sending, indefinite detention supporting Obama for Paul that he accuses them of supporting the murder of Muslim children. I actually am not outraged that progressives haven't abandoned Obama for Paul, um, and I made clear that I don't think um, that they need to and that there's all sorts of rational ways that they would not. Um, so what my argument instead was that it is the following, which is that you can take 
the issues that are being debated in the presidential race in 2012. And I don't mean ancillary, sort of inconsequential, trivial issues. I mean issues that progressive themselves have long claimed are incredibly significant and important. And you can pretty much divide them into two categories. Um, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but this is what I did in, in, in what I wrote. One column would be is these issues, important issues to progressives, um, in which President Obama is better than Ron Paul, meaning he's closer to what the progressive position is than Ron Paul. There are lots of important issues where President Obama is closer, much closer to the progressive position than Ron Paul is. These issues are incredibly important and weighty and consequential. But there's also this other column um, of very weighty and consequential and important issues where Ron Paul is closer, often much closer, to what progressives have always said their position is um, than President Obama. Um, so President Obama is better, a lot better on issues like um, protecting entitlement programs, um, protecting a woman's right to choose, appointing Supreme Court justices, environmental regulations, enforcing minority rights. Um, but Ron Paul is better and often infinitely better on issues of empire and war and killing foreigners for no good reason, um, transparency and secrecy, whistleblowing, the drug war, um, the way the Fed operates in secrecy to transfer wealth to bankers and the upper class. So you have these two columns, one where President Obama is better and one where, President, where, where Ron Paul is better. Um, and my argument was that it's insufficient simply to say as a progressive, oh look, Ron Paul supports these awful, horrible things, therefore nobody should support him because President Obama also supports some really horrible, odious, and unprogressive things. That instead, an honest debate would mean that you would list the evils of Ron Paul and list the evils of Barack Obama and then weigh them. Um, and that's why I said a progressive could reasonably come to the conclusion that the evils of Ron Paul outweigh the evils of Barack Obama. Um, that said, and I just want to briefly highlight this last point and then, and then turn it over to you. Um, there are, the reason why I wrote the column and, and focus on Ron Paul is because there are some extremely important points to make about the fact that Ron Paul is better on not just a couple of issues um, and not just a couple of ancillary issues, but many issues of significant, great importance to progressive. Um, one important aspect to this is that it is amazing in a very positive way to finally have somebody with a national platform in a presidential race going around, not to like-minded audiences, but to evangelical communities in Iowa and very conservative districts in New Hampshire and military communities in South Carolina and saying things like America's criminal justice system is incredibly racist and the drug war um, disproportionately imprisons Latino and African American youth. Or that it is not the United States that is the victim of aggression in the world, but often itself the aggressor. And that's the reason why we have so many people wanting to harm us and asking people to imagine what it must be like to have troops occupying your country and, and drones flying overhead and killing your fellow citizens or imprisoning you without due process. That there's all these arguments that Ron Paul is making that those of us who work on these issues have never been able to get a national figure and in the presidential race of any significance who's leading or, or close to making these arguments. And it's an incredible benefit to have citizens for the first time hearing these views in a presidential race that no one else, Democrat or Republican, are, are expressing. That's one benefit. The other benefit is that it really highlights some extremely significant deficiencies in the Democratic Party and the progressive movement. Um, that the candidate who leads the party and who most progressives will march behind is somebody who takes the opposite view of the ones Ron Paul's expressing. He's Barack Obama, somebody who's aggressively prosecuting this racist drug war. Um, he has claimed the right to assassinate American citizens without due, due process. Um, he has uh, escalated the drone campaign, slaughtered all kinds of children and women and innocent men as well in the Muslim world, is, a, is very fixated on, on secrecy, punishing whistleblowers, um, empowering the Fed, all these areas where if Ron Paul weren't in the race, there would be no debate in the presidential uh, year because Obama is horrible on these things and Republicans besides Ron Paul who are running either agree with him or worse. Um, and so Ron Paul really does show how you could have a progressive candidate standing up and articulating these views 
um, and still be politically successful. And I think that's an incredibly important benefit to his candidacy as well. It doesn't mean you endorse Ron Paul. I don't think Ron Paul has any chance whatsoever of winning the presidency. I don't think very many people, even his supporters, think he does. The issue is that it benefits the debate and the way in which many Americans who don't pay attention except during the presidential race get to think about politics for the first time. And, and that's you know the argument. Well, um, that was um, extremely uh, well expressed. And I want to say, before I say anything else, I did, I do think I got your position wrong. And I'm really sorry about that. And, and when I return to this subject in my next column, I'll, say, I'll certainly say that. Um, I, I wasn't actually even uh, thinking of you primarily. I'm sorry to say that it doesn't sound right. I, I came out wrong. But I was more thinking, actually, of people who, like, like Bob Shear, um, people who, uh, who do, um, pref you know, I think genuinely, of course, genuinely care about things like the, the welfare state. They write endlessly about poverty, about racism, about the whole spectrum of, um, of uh, progressive ideas. Um, and to have them say things like, oh, pure conservatism, values, principle, he's so consistent. Um, that I find very disturbing. And to me, that was sort of an example of uh, something that uh, I think progressives do a lot for reasons we can talk about, which is that they, you know, they do have a tendency to run after the latest shiny thing um, and that there'll be some banner issue of the moment. I, I don't mean that the issues that Ron Paul is, you know, has the positions we like on our banner issues are, are of the moment. They're not. But there's a, there's a, there's a certain kind of just running after uh, 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 someone who is really bad on almost everything, but you like one or two things they do. And then that becomes the big, the big thing. And, I, and it really bothers me. And that was where I got into uh, something that uh, a lot of people have taken issue in my piece, which was which we can talk about later. I know it's on our, our little list, but um, issues of gender and issues of race. That I, I do think it's kind of not an accident when you, people talk a lot about who supports Ron Paul and how it's a lot of military people, and that's, that's very interesting. But if you look at who donates to him, it really is almost all men. It's like four out of five. Um, and if you go to his conventions, it's, there's just a lot of men there. There's a big line. It's one of the few places somebody tweeted that you'd find a long line for the men's room, and you can walk right into the <laughs> ladies' room. Um, and I think that there is a way in which the issues having to do with race and gender get marginalized uh, and get reduced to sort of single issues like, oh, abortion rights, uh, when it's, that, that is something that is, very, is much harder for women to do and people of color to do. And I don't want to say that I'm speaking for all people of color or indeed all women, because I know that, that I'm not. But I just think if you kind of look at the, the demographics, that is what you'll see, um, which doesn't mean that there aren't um, blacks who support Ron Paul and women who support Ron Paul and all that. But um, I think that what, is, what really bothers me about Ron Paul is that I do see the issues that you and I both care about that you've discussed so eloquently as being kind of the first and positive layer of a worldview that is really terrible. Um, and I, would, I think that he gets a lot of support because what's really, for me, what his position boils down to is states' rights. He wants to get rid of everything the federal government does, including some of the bad things like you know, um, killing Muslim children and uh, a lot of the good things, like, for example, um, uh, environmental was, regulation. Environmental regulations, uh, uh, support for schools, mm -hmm. uh, but also he, you know, he has persistently maintained his opposition to um, the Civil Rights Act. Uh, he believes that you should have the right to refuse in your business accom to uh, to accommodate people you don't want to accommodate. So that would basically bring back segregation. And I do think this, that his state's rights have a very Southern flavor. And I think that's where a lot of his support comes from. Um, and that's why, I mean, his support is in the, is, you know, when he goes to these evangelical churches, 
do you really think they're saying, yes, I think that I think pot should be legal? I don't think they're thinking that. I think they're thinking, um, yes, and then we'll get lots of money for homeschooling. And, and then, you know, the, those, those dirty hippies will stop telling, in, in Washington will stop telling us what to do. And we can, have, we can have prayer in the schools and we can make abortion illegal and we'll have judges that, we, that will, will enforce our worldview. I think that's what a lot of it is all about. Yeah, um, I mean, and, I mean, and I guess I, I guess what you know, if I could just I mean you talked no, for a long time I'll talk for a little more too. I guess what I would say is that you know there is really not a reason for people who have the full range of progressive politics to tie themselves like a tin can to the Ron Paul campaign. Um, I think that 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 he discredits those issues because not only would he, for example, n uh, you know, not make war in all these places we don't want him to make war, he'd get us out of the UN, there would be no foreign aid so that, uh, you know, no help for horrible diseases around the world, no help if there's, you know, for big tsunamis and all like that. Uh, no kind of, it, it's that kind of really old-fashioned isolationism that I don't think is, um, is very realistic and I don't think um, would you know, would have a lot of bad consequences as well as, you know, a couple of good consequences. Right. So, yeah, so just a couple of things. I mean, I, I think, first of all, I think you're, you're right that there is some sizable portion of his supporters who basically are standard issue Republicans, but even a little bit more extreme, like kind of the Bircher strain, who are attracted to his sort of vision of the pre-Civil Rights Act, pre-integration, um, kind of Jim Crow era. I think there's some people who just want the government out of their lives in every way, good and bad, and they believe that he's the one who's most extreme on the Republican road and therefore support him. But I also think that there's a very sizable portion of his supporters, and I think anybody who follows his campaign or who has written about it knows this, um, who are not at all Republican voters traditionally um, and probably won't even support the Republican nominee. In fact, Ron Paul probably won't even support the ultimate Republican nominee. Um, in 2008. Um, and, you know, these are a lot of young voters um, who are sitting there cheering for his um, inveighing against foreign wars and the way in which it destroys our economic security as a country and kills foreigners needlessly. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's also a very big segment of the punditocracy um, and this is one part that I, I felt like, um, you know, was, was, was sort of inaccurate in what you said, too. You wrote um, about people who are, are praising Ron Paul's candidacy. candidacy. You said, yeah, and yes, these are all white men. If there are leftist, leftist white women and people of color who admire Paul, they're keeping pretty quiet. Um, and actually, you know, I just don't, I, I didn't think that's true. I've been following the Ron Paul debate very closely. Um, and even before you wrote your piece, there have been lots of very prominent um, minority co political commentators in prominent platforms who have said more or less the same thing I've said and other, others have said um, that Ron Paul's candidacy brings important benefits because um, he is out there arguing critical issues that nobody else is arguing. Um, you have Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter, who, who basically went on blogging heads actually for 15 minutes and, and praised Ron Paul's candidacy with lots of criticisms, but lots of praise as well. Um, Tana Easy Coates did it in The Atlantic saying that, um, you know, Paul is the only person who's willing to stand up and say, imagine what will happen if um, our country were, you know, invaded and occupied um, the African American columnist Les Payne was astonished by Ron Paul standing up in a GOP debate and condemning the American criminal justice system as racist. Um, you have Wendy Kaminer, the former ACLU uh, board, board member, who in the Atlantic said, basically, if you care about civil liberties, um, not certain civil liberties, where Ron Paul is awful, but the civil liberties that have been the most talked about in the war on terror, Ron Paul is far and away the best candidate in the Republican and Democratic field. Cornell West, Zaid Jelani, lots of people of color in very prominent positions making the same argument. And, and you know, I think what, what, in terms of your discussion of gender and, and race that you had in your article and that you just had now, to me, I don't know if you saw this, this, this essay or not, it was by Falguni Sheff, who's a professor of political theory and philosophy at, at Hampshire College. And oh, yeah, I did see that. Did you write, did you see that? I did, of course. Yeah, yeah okay, so 
I mean, the, the point that she made, I'm, I'm really, I, I am fascinated in your, your response to this, um, because it, I think it goes to the heart of what the disagreement that I had with you and what you, you wrote and, and in what you, you just said. And I agree. Look, I think we're on the same page with a lot of these things, um, which is why I wanted to have this conversation with you as opposed to other people who have been proposed, because I do think we're, we're, we're both coming from the same place in terms of believing these issues are important and, and have a difference about whether Ron Paul's candidacy is a good vehicle for bringing them up. But what she was basically, her argument was basically that, um, you know, that it would be nice if there were somebody other than Ron Paul making these arguments in a presidential race. Um, and of course, a lot of us do talk about these issues all the time without, you know, mentioning Ron Paul. I mean, I've spent the last six years more or less working exclusively on, you know, these issues of civil rights abridgment and war and the drug war and these horrible policies that primarily are not white males, but racial and ethnic and religious minorities. Um, but her argument was that for white progressives and for democratic partisans who basically want to say, look, these issues that Ron Paul is shining a light on in a way that none of us can because he's a leading presidential candidate in a presidential year are not sort of, uh, what did you call it? You called it um, a handful of cherries on a blighted tree. Sort of, there's a couple of issues that he's good on. She was saying these issues are of immense importance not to white people, but to people of color, to women in the third world, in the Muslim world, to African Americans who are victimized by the drug war, to, you know, that these policies that he's challenging, that he alone is challenging, and that are bipartisan consensus, are really important to people of color and to women. And that uh -huh. those people who want to deprioritize them and say, oh, look, he's right on a couple of issues, but look at all these much more important issues that he's wrong on, those are the people who are really guilty of talking from white privilege because it's not you who is going to be have your kids blown up by a drone, or it's not you who's going to be put in Gitmo without due process, or put in a cage for using drugs. These are people of color and Muslims and minorities, and it's very easy to be dismissive of the huge values that Ron Paul is well, bringing to our okay, community. Okay, but if, she, if she's right, then black people and people of color should be voting for Ron Paul in droves, but are they? Uh, no, you know, no. what I said, actually, if I just could correct yeah, you yeah, on yeah, one yeah. thing. But, yeah. Yeah, uh, what I said was, if there are leftish white women and people of color who admire Paul, they're keeping pretty quiet. I didn't say there are none of them, but I did say leftish. And the people of color you mentioned, with a few exceptions, are conservatives. John McWhorter is conservative. He doesn't care about a lot of these, these Lowry, issues Glenn where he's West. terribly, terribly wrong. And I would say, you know, um, Suddenly, the, the, you know, the drug war is a very important issue, but I think it's really interesting that all of a sudden it has become this banner issue. Do you, I, I don't even know if we took a poll of, of the black community if they would be in favor of getting rid of all, all drug, of, of making heroin legal. You know, that's a pretty extreme position, um, making cocaine legal. Um, I think, you know, decriminalization of certain things, sure, okay. Um, I don't even know what my position is about, um, you know, making heroin legal. Um, I, I would really need to think about that a lot. But um, uh, I think that some of these issues that have become very banner issues because Ron Paul uh, has, has talked about them and has made them very prominent because he doesn't want to talk about things like, yeah, and if I was president, you could have all the heroin you wanted. But, if you know, if you wanted to travel from New York to Florida in a car as a black person, you might find there's no motels you could stay in for hundreds and hundreds of miles. You might find you couldn't eat in a restaurant. You might find there was no place for you to go to the bathroom. Um, that's what it was like. That's what he wants back, you know? Um, I think that these are not little details. Um, you know, I was just discussing, and oh, I want to say another thing, which is about civil liberties. What are civil liberties? You know something? The right of an American to go into a restaurant and be served is a civil liberty. The sure. right of women to control their own bodies is a civil liberty. Of course. And it's, these are not marginal, separate things that nope. just affect a few people or we can just detach them. They are just as important totally. as, as, the, as freedom of speech. Absolutely. Um, and, and the things that Ron Paul has opposed have made lives better for millions and millions of people. They have made the modern America we live in. Um, you know, I don't, the good part where, where we don't have, we don't have segregation, where you do, you know, if you feel you're, where, where there is an Equal Opportunities Commission, where Ron Paul has said, you know, if a woman is sexually harassed, 
she should quit her job. I mean, what does that tell you, you know, about his, his worldview? Now, that's something, if he was president, he could probably do a lot about. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, that Ron Paul's worldview just to, is, is completely horrible. Um, and that the good things about it flow out of those horrible things. He basically doesn't believe in the functions of government to, uh, to ameliorate anything. Um, you're on your own. That's libertarianism. You don't have health insurance, find a charity or die. He really believes that. Um, and um, I think that what is interesting about his candidacy is that he is the only person who is really talking about um, the issues that we care about. And I think we, you know, maybe we should talk about, move on to, I don't know, we wanted in our little list, we wanted to talk about, you know, well, why is that? And what, if you say you don't want to be associated with Ron Paul, who, you know, in his views that AIDS was hatched in a lab and that the new money, the, the new colored money is intended to track American citizens and all that stuff, say he just is unacceptable. What then? Well, right. I mean, this, you know, this to me is the, the real dilemma. And it's why you know, I wrote about it. I mean, I remember, you know, probably six months ago, maybe nine months ago, before Ron Paul announced his candidacy, there was talk that Gary Johnson, who has a lot of the same views um, as Ron Paul, without a lot of the sort of baggage, um, and he was a popular two-term governor of New Mexico, and all of this was considering running. And I had actually said that I hoped that he ran um, because I thought he would be a good spokesperson for these issues. Because I can tell you, I mean, you know, we all work on our, our certain issues primarily. It doesn't mean that we think those issues are more important than ones we don't work on. All of us can only work on a certain set. But you know, for those of us who work on war on terror issues killing people without due process, um, the drug war, which a lot of us have thought was important, but it doesn't get talked about because the two parties are so completely alike on, on the issues that it's just not part of our debate. Um, things like you know fealty to Israel. Um, the problem really is is that you, know, you can break through in little bits and pieces as a commentator, as an activist, as a writer, um, and get people to be open to the ideas. But the reality is, is that presidential elections are completely dominant in our political culture. I mean, they're what shape what issues are even up for debate. Um, when the two major presidential candidates agree on a certain position, it's just silenced um, in terms of discussion. Um, and so presidential elections are incredibly significant, you know, in terms of shaping how Americans think about politics. There are millions and millions of Americans, maybe most, I don't know, um, you know, who don't read The Nation and don't read Salon um, and don't read very many other political journals um, and who don't even pay attention to politics except when it comes to the presidential election. So if there's nobody out there arguing these positions, um, they're not going to be argued and they're not even going to be on the radar. And that's why, you know, issues like Israel and endless war and empire and the drug war and the Fed um, aren't prominent because both parties are in full agreement on them, basically. Um, and that was why so many of us have been looking for somebody um, to be able to inject these issues into the political discourse. Um, and all the things that you said about Ron Paul, I could quibble with a lot of them, I could disagree with others. There's no question that he's very anathema to progressives in lots of critical ways. He's not going to be the president. Um, I actually think presidents have more power on the stuff where he's good, like foreign policy and civil liberties, um, when it comes to the war on terror type civil liberties, um, and even enforcing the drug war, than say on domestic issues where Congress is more important. But it's not that he's going to be president. The, the question is, people are looking for a way to change the debate um, on these issues, to get Americans more open to these views that they haven't even heard, let alone effectively are advocated. And that's why a lot of people have said, yes, Ron Paul is horrible in lots of ways, but at least he's out there for the first time standing up in places that don't hear these things and advocating these positions. And I don't know, I mean, what is the alternative? If you say, you know, lots of liberals in Congress have worked with Ron Paul in all sorts of ways, like Barney Frank and Alan Grayson and Dennis Kucinich have sponsored Build with him and have reached out to him as the key ally. So if you say he's too toxic, his worldview is too awful, you shouldn't get anywhere near him, I then what is the alternative? I mean, you march behind Barack Obama and all these policies for the next year during the presidential campaign will go unquestioned and unchallenged. And that, to me, is unacceptable. And I think that's what's driving a lot of people to point to the benefits of his candidacy. 
Well, um, I would say that maybe Occupy Wall Street provides another model of how to influence the public debate. I mean, it's really quite remarkable, isn't it, Glenn, that these, you know, people uh, have managed to really, I think, interject a whole new language into the discussion of class, of social class in America, and into what kind of a country are we becoming in general. Um, and they've done that um, not through um, going on television um, and having debates with Mitt Romney and <laughs> all that. Um, there are other ways to do politics than by um, being a presidential candidate. Um, I think you're right that, you know, it's a great platform. Um, and um, that um, that is one of many ways to influence the debate, but it's not the only one. And I guess, you know, maybe it just comes down to, I don't know, sort of kind of a gestalt of politics that I would rather spend my time uh, with Occupy Wall Street um, and that kind of real grassroots sort of a movement that really, that also challenges the nature of what our country is, is becoming in very fundamental ways than with Ron Paul and his um, right-wing libertarians. Um, I just think that the, under the, I don't know, it's like under the, I'm searching for a word, like under the blanket of Ron Paul, <laughs> would, would come in a lot of things we wouldn't like at all. Um, and I don't know, you, I think maybe you're more sympathetic to libertarianism than I am. Um, I would find, you know, let's just throw everything back to the states. Um, very disturbing. For example, I was talking to a, a Ron Paul supporter who was a woman um, who lives in South Carolina, and um, uh, and it was really interesting. And but I said to we were talking. Of course, she's completely uh, in favor of making abortion a crime. But of course, it wouldn't happen. She says at the federal level, even though Ron Paul has also. Um, voted for. Wait, wait, she's against making abortion criminal or she's no, in she favor? No, she was in, in, definitely in favor. And she said, well, it's murder. And I said, so you're saying, like, if the state wanted to prosecute it like it's murder, that would be okay. And she says, well, it is murder. So, in other words, <laughs> if South Carolina wanted to, uh, you know, uh, put doctors on death row, that would be okay with her. And women, too, presumably. Um, and, you know, I just think there's a lot of, in that sort of inchoate uh, right-wing stuff where homeschooling meets anti-choice meets uh, anti global warming denialism. I mean, there's all that stuff out there. There is just, Ron Paul is promoting that, too. Um, and that, I think, is really toxic. Um, and I just don't want to be part of the, uh, looking at the whole Ron Paul picture and saying, like my colleague John Nichols at The Nation, uh, praising his, quote, pure conservatism. Why would I praise pure, pure conservatism? I'm not a conservative. Right. Um, what's great about, I, I'm not even so big on purity. <laughs> you know? I mean, this is politics we're talking about. Um, so I think there, has, there have to be other ways. And I, I agree, you know, The Nation and Salon are probably not, going to be able to do this, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Occupy Wall Street is a is a much that that is, is a way to is a is a way to start affecting this debate. Yeah. Look, I mean I you know I think it's a great point. I agree with you completely. I mean I've been, you know, writing about Occupy Wall Street um, in the most enthusiastic ways that I can from the very start. I just, you know, I went on my book tour and the thing I was much more excited about than the book events I was doing was you know, going to these encampments and speaking at a bunch of them and um, you know, I think it's one of the most exciting things and, and important things to happen in politics in a long time. And, and the big reason is, is that, as you suggested, um, it's effectuating change, not just in terms of policy change, but debate and, and how people conceive of politics. And it's doing it outside of the political, the, the two-party system. It's doing it through a completely bottom-up, organic means of um, organizing and protesting. Um, it has all the right values. Uh, it's providing a template for how people can reinstall fear in the hearts of elites. 
um, which I think is one of the critical priorities. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Occupy Wall Street. I agree with everything you said about the potential for it to change and, and all of that. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is that I do think um, that one of the distinctions between Occupy Wall Street and the Ron Paul president, you know, candidacy, um, in terms of their benefit, uh, is that I do think that you know things get very easily pigeonholed and, and kind of put into this kind of ideological box. Um, and Occupy Wall Street got depicted very early on as sort of this left wing movement, even though um, it has a lot in common with a lot of the anger that spawned the original Tea Party before it got co-opted by by the Republicans. Um, it has, you know, these views and, and discontent that I think pervades the citizenry and transcends ideology. I think, you know, Fox News and the right wing noise machine kind of trained their followers to see Occupy Wall Street as sort of the socialist movement that's of the left. And therefore, a lot of people just tune out when it comes to that. Um, the way people on the left do with, with the Tea Party. One of the things that I find fascinating about Ron Paul and the candidacy of Ron Paul um, is exactly that he is a right-wing libertarian running in the Republican Party in extremely conservative states and bringing that message there. And I'm not sure that Occupy Wall Street um, or, or things like it could achieve that. I don't see them as mutually exclusive. I see them both as, as beneficial um, on these issues. But let me just let me ask you this, because the one thing you know you keep you keep bringing up. Um, are all the things that you find odious about Ron Paul's worldview. Um, and like I said, I don't, you know, I think some of them are overstated. I think some of them are a bit oversimplified um, and alarmist. Um, some of them are accurate. But let me just conceive that there's a bunch of horrible things that he thinks. Um, and clearly, from the progressive worldview, there's no question that that's true. So your argument is, well, look, I don't want to be part of this candidacy that has all these horrible positions. And the reason that you know I actually wrote my first piece and called it the, I forget what it was, the, the progressive fallacies on Ron Paul is because that is true that Ron Paul has a bunch of horrible views, but it is also true that the Democratic Party really does have a bunch of horrible views as well. Um, you know, and I mean I, I don't want to go through them all again, but but they they they've resulted in some really horrible and awful things. Um, they destroy minority communities in the terms of the drug war. They kill all kinds of people all throughout the world. They keep the, the system of finance that benefits bankers at the expense of the middle class going and churning along. They pro propagate the status quo much more than they subvert or undermine it. Um, they've you know, embraced um, more radical positions than George Bush and Dick Cheney did when it comes to presidential power and the right to conduct themselves in secret and with no checks or due process put people in prison, kill them, et cetera. Really awful, horrible things as well. Um, and so, you know, when I hear people saying, as you've said, um, I don't want to be anywhere near the Ron Paul candidacy, even though it has benefits, because they have all these awful prongs to it, I wonder why you don't think the same way about the Democratic Party. Not to say that I want, I expect you to say, I'm not going to vote for the Democrats or anything else like that, but why doesn't that same mindset get applied to the Obama presidency and, and, and his party? Well, I guess it's a little bit for the same reason that, uh, I guess it's because one is in the Democratic Party so that you see uh, your, I'm trying to formulate this in a careful way, and I'm, I'm going to fail, but um, uh, if you see the Democratic Party and to the left of there as the place where you do your politics and the place that uh, in the end of the day you'll, you are associated with, then you see fighting, you're fighting that sort of from within. Um, you don't want to go back 50 years and re-argue segregation. Um, you, uh, issues like who would control the Supreme Court are, are become very important. Um, I think that you have done a real service in reminding you know, people, Democrats and people on the left end of the spectrum of, you know, of, of really that 
the Democratic Party, never so great, uh, is, uh, you know, has really kind of moved very far to the right um, in, in all kinds of issues that we don't talk enough about. That's really true. But, you know, it's a little bit, I was thinking about this, like, okay, take Roosevelt. Roosevelt, who, you know, uh, if, if you look, think about his record, he put all those Japanese American citizens in, you know, in concentration camps or relocation camps or whatever you want to call them. He turned back the St. Louis, and, you know, sending all these Jews back to Hitler. Um, he, the social security system he set up, it discriminated against women. Uh, a lot of his social welfare programs is discriminated against blacks. He never uh, uh, favored a federal anti-lynching law, which is one of the you know big causes of. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, black civil liberties people and left wing people at that time. He, the whole Democratic Party was this weird alliance between southern white racists and uh, northern unions, ethnics, and uh, you know ethnic groups and um, all the rest. And black people in the north, once you got to vote, um, were tended to be Republicans at that time precisely because of that. But anyway, you know, there's just no question that my grandparents, Jews that they were, were going to vote for FDR. Um, <laughs> there was, you know, they weren't going to say, oh, he turned back to St. Louis, I'm not voting for him. Um, you know, terrible as that was, because it, at the end of the day, you know, people make fun of the politics of lesser, lesser of two evils, but that's always what it's going to be. Right. That's always what it's going to be. And if you want to be pure and go to heaven, then you don't vote. Um, but once you're in that discourse, you are choosing between various horrible people who want to do one list of horrible things or another list of horrible things, and some, very often it's 90% the same list of horrible things. Um, so I would say, you know, you have really inspired me that I have got to, uh, you know, feature more highly in, in my own writing and thinking these, these very important issues. But you haven't persuaded me that I have to do it by saying nice things about Ron Paul. Right. No, no. I mean, look, I mean, you know, um, you, and, and like I said, I mean, I, you know, I'm not arguing against lesser of two evil voting um, because I think you're right. You know, it, it, the political system is, is such that you're always going to have that. My guess is that if Ron Paul were, um, in the Oval Office, and I don't think he ever will be. I don't, you know, but I think if he were, I think that his, you know, what John Nichols has called this sort of purity of conservatism would probably give way to lots of power considerations in politics and all of that. Um, I guess what I want to see a little bit more of, um, and I don't really mean from, you know, I don't mean from you, because I think you actually, among writers in, you know, mainstream liberal journals, do, are, are probably more critical of, of Democrats and even progressives. Um, than most other people, but you know that's what you just said. That I mean, that's really what kind of inspired me to write that original column. Was I was seeing these progressive runarounds saying, "Oh my God, look at this horrible thing Ron Paul thinks, and look at this other horrible thing Ron Paul thinks," without ever saying, you know, as though if you can identify some horrible thing that someone believes, then it uh, then it then it's proof that you stay away from that person as far away as you can. Um, and what was missing from that equation for me was the acknowledgement. Um, that it isn't just Ron Paul who believes in lots of horrible things. He may believe in more than others, but it's not just him. It's, it's the Democratic Party and um, even lots of progressive politicians who are supporting and enabling and doing lots of horrible, awful, evil, odious things as well. And the election isn't a good versus evil election. It's, you know, here are various politicians who are doing and believing a bunch of awful, horrible things, and the question is to figure out weighing them honestly and candidly, which one um, is the is the worst one, and then voting for the one that's that's less. And you know, I think Ron Paul aids in that process. To be honest, like I think I don't think we would be having a bogging heads discussion talking about the drug war and the Democratic Party or Israel and the Democratic Party um, or you know this idea that we should imagine what it's like to live in a country that's treated the way we treat other countries and how, what, what that would, would, would entail. Or at least maybe you and I would, but lots of other people wouldn't be talking about these things if it weren't for the Ron Paul candidacy. And you know, for someone who's been wanting these issues in the floor for so long, I guess, and I'm not the only one, you know, I, you react with some degree of just celebration, even recognizing that he's, you know, lots of his positions are, are awful. Um, 
And I think it's just a sign of kind of how, unfortunately, you know, what low quality our political culture is that it does take a Ron Paul just to even insert these extremely consequential policies into the debate. Um, well, okay, so he did that, so now could he go away? <laughs> we can talk about them without talking about him. <laughs> well, I guess Thanks and goodbye. More and, and, but then, but then, but, you know, but then the question becomes: even once he does stop running, there's going to be all these people out there who, you know, it's interesting. I mean, Barack Obama brought a lot of young people into the political process who would not have gotten involved in the absence of of the Obama candidacy. There's a lot of people, you know, who are that way with Ron Paul, and those people are in the process and up for grabs and. You know, I think that there are a lot of them attracted to his candidacy, not because of his opposition to the Civil Rights Act or his, you know, desire to overturn Roe Ro versus Wade, but because of the good issues that we've been talking about, especially younger citizens. Um, and I would hope that we then start to figure out, sort of post Paul, how to take those good parts and integrate them into the progressive movement or the left or the Democratic Party um, or politics generally, and, and keep those issues sort of vibrant and. and talked about. Um, yeah, those issues keep right. them vibrant. The but good what ones. I wonder about what I wonder about here are all these young people and they don't have jobs and they they uh, are uh, the you know suffering terribly from both the economy and also you know what about their Pell grants, what about student debt, all like that. Um, and I would not want to encourage them to think that a less that a government that sort of did less in the social welfare department would be good for them. You know that like uh, that uh, oh social security won't be there for me so we shouldn't have it. That kind of thing that you sometimes hear from right wing young people. Mm -hmm. um, or and that because to me they are the victims of the massive kind of defunding of the sort of good elements of of government. I mean, look, right now, look what we have. We have, like, what is it, one in seven, one in eight people on food stamps in this country? I mean, that is a tremendous statement about how people are struggling and suffering. And I do think that uh, I wouldn't want people to get the message, oh, yeah, if the government does less for you and just lets the economy rip, you know, the economy, quote unquote, lets the market rip. Everything's going to be great for you, you know, um, and that the market can solve every problem. And I think that there, um, because the state has done such a poor job, um, and also people don't really know what the state does for them, um, they don't really follow these things very closely, um, I think that um, that kind of uh, libertarianism could be very destructive. Mm -hmm. But you know what's interesting, Katha, I mean, and I agree that, you know, I mean, I think it would be a, a moral outrage to start, especially in this economy with income and wealth inequality being at, you know, truly destructive levels to start exacerbating it by cutting into social programs and the sort of remaining safety net that keeps people at least in some, you know, civilized form of life. Um, but one of the, if, if, if you go and talk to a lot of those younger people who are very anxious about their economic future, one of the reasons why the Paul candidacy appeals to them is that, you know, he's out there making this argument. And it's not a completely true argument, but it's true in a pretty substantial way, which is one of the reasons why, you know, we have all these pressures of austerity. And remember, you know, President Obama wanted to raise the eligibility age for Medicare and slash Social Security pretty significantly. He offered those things as part of the last um, debt uh, uh, increase negotiation, um, according to every major media outlet. One of the reasons why there's such austerity pressure is because we have these unsustainable imperial policies of, you know, huge numbers of bases all around the world managing the Middle East, um, constant endless warfare, this extremely bloated military, um, even the drug war, which is incredibly expensive in the criminal justice system to keep prosecuting and arresting and imprisoning huge numbers of Americans, and then the opportunity cost of losing their contributions positively to society, that it's not even like you, can, you can't even really extricate the domestic and foreign 
policy questions completely um, or even substantially because a big part of why you know, there's such pressure that the political class and the financial class is imposing on the rest of us to have these austerity policies is because the choices that we're making are so warped and distorted and we're not putting our money into education and social security and, you know, expanded Medicare. We're instead putting them into, you know, newer and, and sleeker drones and huge numbers of bombs and massive military bases and sprawling prisons. Um, and I think part of the appeal that young voters um, see in the Paul candidacy is that economic message that, you know, if we keep choosing to be this bloated empire, that it'll be impossible even for the most well-meaning liberal politicians to provide good entitlement programs for the middle and, and, and lower classes. Yeah, except that Ron Paul doesn't favor those good entitlement programs. He thinks let's get rid of all the, first of all, he thinks we should take the soldiers from, you know, Korea and places like that and put them on the Mexican border. It's not like, you know, uh, he, I mean, he does have some sort of funny, weird twists in all of this. It's not like he's saying, let's just, we'll send them home to, back to, you know, go um, work in their communities. Um, like, as civilians, he wants to put them on the Mexican border. He said that. He doesn't want there to be a fence because that could be used to keep Americans in um, as we all try to flee, you know, the, the uh, giant tentacles of the welfare state to go live in Mexico. <laughs> but he wants there to be all these soldiers on the Mexican border. Um, no, not so comparable to, to the imperial presence that, you know, we have in the world. I mean, that would be a... I mean, in a Paul presidency, which will never exist, and everyone knows will never exist, um, there would be massive decreases beyond the status quo in military spending, and no matter how many troops you wanted to put on the Mexican border. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I think that's pretty clear. And then the cost of the drug war as well, um, that you would add, add to that. But, I mean, don't you think that is a real question? I mean, don't you, I mean, one of the threats, the biggest threats to the, the sort of New Deal and, and post-New Deal entitlement programs um, and to, you know, what has guaranteed an American middle class is not just Republican ideology. Um, it is financial constraints that come from trying to be um, this militaristic empire and having these sprawling, this sprawling, turning American yes, to I mean, it's incredibly yes. expensive. It is incredibly expensive and we get very little back for it that's good. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I mean, I just want to say, I opposed both these wars from the very beginning. I opposed the war in Af Afghanistan before it even started, um, for which Andrew Sullivan said that I was like a person who sees a rape victim and blames it on her short skirt. He actually said that. You know, um, it's funny, he was, I, this is, you know, that right after, you know, I remember 2000, after the 9-11 attacks, when I first started paying attention to online commentary, one of the very first things I encountered was your article in which you had said almost immediately after 9-11, and in retrospect, I really do think it was heroic of you, basically said that you had discouraged your daughter from hanging the American flag outside of the building. Oh, yeah, they're going to put that column on my grave. <laughs> that's, that's like the, old, the, most, the, the most notorious thing I ever wrote. You're right, and then he, that was the, my first exposure to sort of this online debate post 9-11 and, and, and to your, your writing. And, and Andrew Solomon had basically declared you the leader of the fifth column as a result of that, that column. So, yeah, yeah. So you've been, that's why, I mean, I know you've been you know, an eloquent and outspoken opponent longer than most of us um, of all of these policies. So, you know, you, I would think you would be excited as well to see, you know, huge numbers of Republican voters voting for a candidate who is steadfastly against them. I just wonder if that's why they're voting for him. You know, well, that's, at the very, that's at the very least, they're voting for him despite that, right? Those are not just qualifying views, which is pretty amazing in itself. And I do think, you know, like I said, I do think a lot of these sort of heterodox new voters are definitely attracted to, by that message. Um, but anyway, I don't know. I, I, I think we've had a, a great discussion. Um, yeah, it was, it was really interesting. I was actually kind of dreading it. <laughs> 
Well, I was actually kind of dreading it, but it's uh, the kind of discussion, especially in the midst it was of fun. the just debate that took place. What? Where I, it's the sort of discussion, especially given that it's in the midst of this contentious debate, where both people had to kind of make a concerted effort to make it more constructive rather than acrimonious. And I, I think we did a good job. Good. Well, good for us. Yeah, so this was really fun, and I hope someday we'll get to have a real-life drink together. Would love that, Catherine. Thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks to you, thanks to you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.